Are you ready to become awesomer? Hello, everyone. My name is Umar Hamid. I'm your host on the No Limit Selling Podcast, where industry leaders share their tips, strategy, and advice on how you can become better, stronger, faster. Just before we get started, I've got a question for you. Do you have a negative voice inside your head? We all do, right? I'm going to help you remove that voice in under 30 days guaranteed. Not only remove it, but transform it. So instead of the voice that sabotages you, there's one that propels you to much higher levels of performance and success. There's a link in the show notes. Click on it to find out more. All right, let's get started. Hello, everyone. So privileged today to uh, be talking to Aaron Prickle. He's a sales guru helping people increase their sales because ultimately at the end of the day, the only thing that really counts is how we grow our businesses, how we grow our ideas. And to do any of those two things, we need to be able to sell our ideas. Aaron, welcome to the program. Well, thank you very much for having me. So before we started recording, we were daydreaming about uh, the year of 5050 or 2050. And the, what's interesting is this, that we still will be doing what we do. We'll have better tools. I won't be seeing you on a screen. You'll be holographically projected here or beaming over here. But ultimately, at the yep. end of the day, there's going to be people selling and they're going to go that, you know, hey, I feel kind of uncomfortable asking for the sale. Or if they say no, are they uh, disliking me or is it my offer? All that human stuff is still going to be there in 2050. Thoughts? Yeah, I don't think that the human component of sales will never go away. And, and never is an absolute and a strong word. And I understand that. Um, but th- there'll always be the human component. And there's always going to be the um, fear of rejection, the wanting to be liked. Uh, there's always going to be that, whether it's 2020, 2021 or 2050. You know, what's interesting is like Shakespeare should be dead and buried. But the only reason it's still relevant is because all that stuff he talked about, jealousy, fear, ambition, all that stuff remains true and it will remain true in 5020. And so let's talk about, we have people go into the profession of sales, into the profession of leadership. And what limits us is what's happening in our mindset on how well we do. Well, in, in um, I was actually having this conversation this morning and um, skill sets get you so far. And Umar, as a professional in this industry, mm-hmm. you always say that, right? Skill sets only get you so far. So let's take your mindset comment uh, and let's look at it two different ways. One is you have the um, kind of that, those will to sell components of how strong of a desire do you even have to be successful from a sales perspective, which is strong for most sales mm-hmm. professionals. The challenge is when you get to the commitment side, are people willing to do those uncomfortable things that they need to do to get to where they want to go? And you can want something all day long, but if that commitment to do those uncomfortable things isn't there, to your exact point, Mark, rejection gets in the way and wanting to be like gets in the way and, and that six inches between our ears is ultimately what gets us in trouble. So skill sets can get us so far, but how committed are you to doing the uncomfortable things you need to do to get to where you want to go? I love what you're saying there. And if we take a pull back just a little bit, pull that lens back just a little bit, we go, okay, what makes those things uncomfortable is what's happening in our mindset, right? In the first place, because there's other people is like, so I'll give you an example. I was talking to this uh, salesperson and he is a freaking guru. He walks on water and he is the number one sales guy in his company last five years. The one area he has a problem is asking for referrals because a different set of rules come up in his mind. Keep in mind, these are customers that love him, want to recommend him, but he just can't ask. And what it turned out was when he was seven years of age, he was in a room with his dad and one of his dad's buddies from work. And his dad made a comment to his buddy, real men don't ask for help. And little Paul in that room grabbed that thought. And it's like asking for a million dollars for what he's selling, piece of cake. Asking for a referral violates the belief of asking for help. So sales in the grand scheme of things is not that difficult. The difficult part is, is getting this stuff right. So can you think of a particular client you've had, don't name names, but somebody that you could clearly see that Judy or Sam could be a freaking rock star and how you got them over that uh, Rubicon to get them to kind of go, yeah, I can do this. Like it's not an overnight thing. So tell us about one of your client stories, how you got them to really believe that they could do anything they freaking wanted. Well, Umar, you gave a a perfect example of even some of the self-limiting belief wrapped around asking for referrals. And 
Um, uh, we heard a professional years ago mention that uh, you know eighty percent of our scripting is instilled in you by the time you're five. Right. So by the time the five by the time you're mm-hmm. five years old, you have scripting. So um, I, I won't even make it from an individual perspective. Let's just look at more of a, a macro of even head trash around talking about money. And, and to your point, think about when we're mm-hmm. kids and it's the, um, if Umar was a young boy and asked his parents, Hey, I'm going to walk down the road and ask Mr. Or Mrs. Smith, uh, how much they paid for their new car. Our parents would have said, that's none of your business. That, that, that's none of your business. We but don't talk about money. It's oh, rude. Yeah, absolutely. Especially other people's money, Umar. You don't talk about that. So part of it is, it's to your point, it's no the worse re- than that, our money. <laughs> <laughs> or even our money. Exactly, right? So how, how do you start to navigate people through that, right? It's the reshaping of beliefs, right? So our beliefs drive our actions that create a feeling of normalcy that ultimately provide a result. And if you want to change, you know, the, the corny one-liner, for a lack of better words, is if you want to change what you've always achieved, you must first change what you've always believed. So there, there is a reshaping. Absolutely, and that's the hardest thing to do, right? Oh, yes, absolutely it is. Right. So first it's a process. Of so I'll tell you one of my childhood memories. Yeah. I'll tell you one of my childhood memories of money, actually my first memory of money, because when there's like lots of emotions, our brain remembers those events more completely than any other. It was a fight between my mom and my dad. It was super late at night. And back in the day, you used to get paid in uh, actual money. You got a pay packet. And my dad took his money, wad of money for that week, and he ripped it in half. It says, I don't give a shit about this. And even as a kid, I had to be maybe five years old. I knew that he was going to tape that money back up. And what he was saying was bullshit, that money was really important. And he just ripped it to be theatrical in that moment. But that kind of created a negative association around money. Money causes fights. And what's amazing is, is this, is that you could have a parent that says they've got twins, identical in every way. And mom says, you'll get your pocket money when you clean your room. And twin one goes, you got to earn money. It's amazing. And the second twin goes, oh, she's keeping money away from me. You know, money's dangerous. So it doesn't matter what you do as a parent. Kids are going to get what they want to get because we make meaning of it. So how do you help your clients kind of get over those money issues? Well, uh, if you go back um, to even the example, part of it is first having the awareness of what's going on. Right. First, you have to have the awareness of what's going on. And the second thing is, where is it coming from? And then the third piece is, how does that drive to the correlation and context of everyday sales or business? Because once people realize, oh, my gosh, having a, a difficult time talking about money, uh, that limits me in budget conversations or I take things at face value. And, you know, there's the power of journaling. There's the power of uh, reshaping beliefs. There's a power of talking with people that actually have strong money tolerances. So at the end of the day, uh, those small little subtle shifts over time start to rewrite our own tapes or records where the conversation just becomes conversational versus a forced event, for a lack of better words. So let's go back to that journaling comment. A, do you keep a journal? And B, how does journaling really help around issues around money? Uh, short there answer it is. Yes. <laughs> There it is. It sits right here next to me. Uh, short answer is yes. Um, uh, since I guess we're being humble amidst, amidst just you, I, and a couple of friends who are listening, um, I grew up in a very small town. Um, did not come from a, a lot of money. And one of the things I had a journal for years is I deserve more. I deserve more. I deserve more. I deserve more. Um, to free up that mindset, back to your example of uh, little Paul when he was five and his dad said, you know, don't ask for help. Um, part of that's just breaking free of the uh, abundance mentality versus a scarcity mentality. And journaling can unlock the power of an abundance mentality. Ah, I love it. One of the things I like is uh, a gratitude journal, which could be combined. But one of the areas where I think people stop short is they go, I am grateful for my son. And I kind of go, eh, so what? But if you go, I am grateful for my son because, 
And what comes after the because is, is where the juice is, where the passion is, where the energy is. I'm grateful for my work because, because is where the energy is. And Umar, uh, since I can see you while we're talking, there's a, the first line and everything is, I journal every day because it's important to me. There's your because word. Nice. Because is excellent. I can see tomorrow's entry. Do your journal. I spoke with Umar. I need help now. <laughs> I do this exercise sometimes where I ask people to take out money out of their wallet and at the count of three, rip whatever denomination that is, a $20 bill, a $50 bill, a $100 bill. And some people rip it and they kind of go, oh my God, I didn't think I could do that. Like it's a cathartic moment. Keep in mind, everybody knows they're going to tape it back together. They're not going to lose the value, but the emotions come up and other people say, how dare you? You can't do that to money. And it really brings up what's happening on the internal aspect. So as you're talking to your clients, they're telling you, Aaron, these are my views about money. And these views about money are what they want the world to know. I'm cool with money. I want money. I'm amazing money. Then they have this sense of who they are. And it could be scarcity or whatever. Then there's the internal, what's actually happening. So how do you navigate the bullshit we all tell other people? Look at me, I'm pretty. Check Facebook. Everybody has an amazing life there. Yep. But then you've got to how they think things are going and then how things are actually going. How do you bridge that gap for people? Or do you bridge that gap? Well, take, take the example you gave, Umar. <laughs> there's a, an exercise we help our clients with about uh, write down one of your most embarrassing money or financial scenarios or situations of life. And, and you collect them all from everybody. And then you f don't write names down, but you read them out loud. And what people realize is they're not the only ones, right? Umar, we all think we live on this island and we're all this unique, special, I'm the only one, but it's it's human nature. So again, part of it is just the understanding that it's part of being human. But again, once you get that understanding that you're not alone, now it's working through it. Now it's what, where do those beliefs and convictions come from? How does that correlate to your everyday sales conversation where when you reshape beliefs, you actually help others? Would you want your doctor to be uncomfortable talking about money with you? No. Would you want your doctor to have a low money tolerance and he or she change the medical help they would provide based upon their own concepts of money? No. So we don't want our doctors to do that to us. So why do we do that same disservice when we're in front of a great potential client? I mean, it, it hurts both parties. Absolutely. So what was the question you had them write down about money? Yeah, write down uh, an embarrassing situation you had regarding your finances or money. You know, people will say things, you know, gosh, uh, um, uh, I took out a bunch of credit cards in college and got behind on debt or I filed for bankruptcy or it, it, it could be a myriad of things, but it's nothing more than helping people understand that they're not alone. And we've all had scenarios or situations around money or certain beliefs around money. And once people realize they're not on an island, it gives them permission to take a breath and figure out, here's what I can do about it. So Aaron, you are not a liar. And if you said to a group of people that, you know, hey, we all have money issues, we've all got these embarrassing things, you just need to kind of let that go and kind of move on. And that would have on a scale of one to 10, the impact of a zero or a one, or maybe a two, if you're really good at what you do. But the exercise you described where their peers all write this down, and then they get to hear what everybody is saying, that impact is much larger. What would you say it was? Not a one or a two, that would be a what kind of impact out of 10? You know, let's, let's call it a, a, you know, everything depends on the person, but we'll put a number to it. That, that's a seven or an eight. I mean, it, it helps eyes open yeah. up and realize what, what really exists. So why do you think that has a bigger impact? Because that group of people could trust you and could know you would not lie. But if you said it, it's only got a small impact and a one or two or three, whatever that number happens to be. But when they hear it from everybody... Why do you think that has a bigger impact in changing who they are? What do you think the psychological aspect is? And social proof, social proof. And also they believe, oh my yeah, gosh, I think, here comes this guy or gal who was quote unquote being compensated to help us. Of course, he's going to say that versus no, it's social proof. We're pack animals. Human beings are pack animals. And that's brilliant. I think social proof is brilliant. And I think there's something really special about our peers, 
Uh, a good example is when you have people join the military, they come from all walks of life through the U.S. City slickers, sophisticated, dumber than a bag of hammers, all come together, different values, different norms. They go through basic training. They join a platoon. And I would suspect none of them would risk their lives for the commander in chief or their general or whatever. But for each other, they will take a bullet and do heroic things. So I think that social proof, but also being part of that peer group is so powerful. And I think that's why Sandler works really, really well. That it's not just a come in for a day training, meet a bunch of people, make promises, man, we've got to get together and never do it. And just that continual gathering of uh, your tribe, helping you get better and perhaps once in a while calling you out on your bullshit. Yeah. Yep. It's it's no different than exercise. And, and look at how if we were all going to get ready to run a marathon, we don't go to the gym and run on the treadmill for eight hours and say, poof. And, and changing, reframing the mind, reframing skill sets, um, rebuilding a culture is not a flip of a switch. It takes a community. It takes a group. Um, and those who are committed find ways to have the short bursts over long periods of time uh, so they can ultimately get the results they're looking for. Absolutely. And uh, so as how long have you been a Sandler guy? Uh, since 2007. Too long. Too long. <laughs> not long enough then. Too long. So even this last month or so, as you're teaching what you teach, I suspect you're getting insights or more granularity on what you're teaching. Like you get insights as you teach. So tell me about one of the recent ones where you're teaching the same thing, plus or minus, but you're getting by the questions, by the interactions, you're also getting uh, better at what you do. Tell us about one of the latest insights that you've gotten. Umar, there's been a trend um, and, and I haven't quite put my finger on what's causing the trend recently, but since the turn of the new year, there, there's a lot of sales professionals playing defense out there. Um, and there's been what do you big, mean? Say it again. What do you mean? De playing defense? Um, doing a lot of justifying, a lot of defending, a lot of explaining, a lot of uh, handling problems that really aren't their problem, a lot of jumping through hoops that don't need to be jumped through. Uh, not a lot of equal business stature created. It's the perception. It's the uh, high and almighty prospect. And I'm just a salesperson. Um, and that, that defense is causing uh, a lot of sales professionals to, you know, have to worry about handling objections. A great salesperson doesn't handle objections. A great one minimizes them from occurring in the first place. Um, and that's been a conversation no matter what industry we're blessed to help, no matter what tenure uh, of um, a team has been a very consistent uh, trend since the beginning of this year. Thank you for sharing that. And here's my theory on it. And it's just a theory and it's probably bullshit, but uh, bear with me. I think we're at a particular time where there's a lot of fear in the world. And even if you've got a job, you're not sure what's going to happen soon. And I think once we get in that fear mode, we react differently. Even though our intellect tells us what to do, that deeper mindset piece comes up and it gets us to play safer and play more defensive. And we make excuses for not actually being bolder than we should. And some people let go of the shackles of the past and all of a sudden they awaken in these kind of moments. But I think for most of us, it's safer to go defensive than it is to even stay at where we were before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and uh, I got to thank Emily in our office. She uses the word fatigue. You know, mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me. I think there's some pandemic fatigue, and so the you know the strong sales reps, um, you know, they didn't miss a beat, and they continually did what they needed to do, and consistently were bold. Um, but there's a little bit of a fatigue going on where people channeled a higher level of commitment out of fear originally. And then that tank is just empty and it's not a consistent tank that's full, but they've had to leverage it for the first six, nine, 12 months. And to your point, you kind of wake up and snap out of it. And it's pe pe the people who are not strong are exhausted. And when they get exhausted, they play defense. This guy wrote this book, Marcus Aurelius, Emperor of Rome, a long time ago. And this was... He had different chapters in the book. One was about, you know, your family. You know, shit goes wrong with your family all the time and you're worrying about your cousin and this is going on. And the punchline of the chapter is, but Aaron, at least you're not dead. 
And he talks about friends disappointing you. Punchline of the chapter, at least you're not dead. So we go back full circle on our podcast and it comes back to mindset. And I'm going to invite you to do something. This will get you tossed out of the Sandler franchise system and you'll never be invited back. But the next time you do one of the meetings, get people to get a newspaper if they still exist or a book and do gestalt at the beginning of your Zoom meeting is to say, okay, right now you're in this place. There's lots of pent up anger and frustration. And I want you to get a book and I want you to go back to that movie network. I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it in more and get them to beat the book on the desk and just let all of that out of the system. It'll be a group thing. It'll be cathartic. And they'll kind of go, okay, Aaron, what do we need to do now? <laughs> hey, to get, get a little cathartic out. So have, have you seen, Umar, where uh, that exercise has helped people? I have, actually. I went through it uh, when I was my first step into self-development. I was in a course. And they said, you know, what's the one thing that's been keeping you angry? And it was this family I knew that, you know, pretty decent people. But their dog barked and it made, made a lot of noise. And so the bastards had the vocal cords cut on the dog. And I thought that was like the worst crime against humanity I had seen. And I'd been holding that and I got this newspaper and I started beating the desk saying words that we can't say on this conversation. (laughs) But it was just like releasing all of that in this one moment and everyone else was doing their stuff. And it was just like a insanity, but everybody at the end of it went, whew, got that out of my system. I can move on with my life. Aaron, before we part somebody today- no, no, somebody mentioned, please go ahead. Say, somebody mentioned some, yeah, that uh, there is, uh, there, are thing, there are things called break rooms uh, where you can literally pay money to go in and break things. So Umar, uh, I like your advice to help get a little catharting out to, to kind of cleanse the soul a little bit. So Aaron, before we part company, I'd like you to uh, share a mind hack, a simple trick that you use or you recommend. And I'll give you uh, an example. Yesterday, I was interviewing this totally brilliant guy and he said his mind hack, he called it more of an engineering hack, is that he's got a pad of paper and he writes down all the things he needs to spend time on today. It's not all the things he has to do, but all the things he has to spend time on. And then he gets all those individual things and he puts them together in a puzzle for the day. So you might get something that requires a lot of thought process on activity one, then activity two might be just something simple takes five minutes to do, but it still needs doing, but it's almost like a relief from high intensity. Then he goes back to another intense thing and that's how he gets maximum output. And this guy had uh, running two companies, uh, writing uh, another book, multi-marathon, kind of doing those three marathons at a time kind of guy. He says, I turn my phone off at six o'clock every evening and there's no more work after that. And I get more done than anyone else. And his trick was using that simple mechanism. Do you have any kind of mind hack that you'd recommend? Our biggest thing within our four walls, Umar, um, we are big believers in our dream boards. And our dream boards are nothing more than the pictures of the experiences uh, that we're looking to uh, encounter within the next year. And you, you mentioned the other gentleman. But when you can see those dream boards or goal boards on a daily basis, and it helps compel you bringing this conversation full circle to do those uncomfortable things. And when you do, when you make it mission over commission, uh, you're never poor. And when you look at those dream boards, that is your mission of what you're looking to experience or accomplish. And it helps reframe that mindset on those mornings, middays, late days, where you kind of have that feeling. And it's nothing more than a way to condition your mind as you look at those pictures of what's truly important to your life and why you do what you do on a daily basis. Aaron, thank you so much for sharing that. And thanks so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Umar, it was a pleasure, my man. Thank you for having me. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you very much, Umar. If you enjoyed this episode, please go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. And if you're looking for more tools, go to my website at nolimitselling.com. I've got a free mind training course there that's going to teach you some insights from the world of neuro-linguistic programming, and that is the fastest way to get better results. 